I'm very pleased uh, to welcome next uh, an activist and a writer and a researcher from France, uh, a very high profile campaigner. His name is Marwan Mohamed. And he's going to speak to you uh, next, and he's going to talk a little bit more about the way in which we can move from consciousness raising an argument towards action. Uh, Marwan is, amongst many other things, uh, an active member of the Committee Against Islamophobia in France, and he actually has an article in the current edition of the Arches Quarterly, which is available on the book stand over there. Big welcome for Marwan Mohamed. Get in that train in Paris. We'll be there to welcome you. And let's call it the Freedom Train. I didn't choose Islamophobia as a subject. I didn't pick this subject. Uh, I'm a statistician. I'm a mathematician by training. My job is to use statistics and probabilities to make sense of things. So I didn't choose Islamophobia. It came to me. It came to me when my son has been excluded from a school event just because he doesn't want to be poor. It came to me when my wife goes outside with friends and is being insulted just because she wears a headscarf. So I didn't choose this uh, fight, rather it chose me. The situation in France has gone from bad to worse, and this you know about. Uh, every two days, a Muslim or a Muslim is being aggressed, a victim of Islamophobia. Every two weeks, a mosque is being attacked, or a cemetery is being profaned. 75% of the victims are women. Kenza is just one of them. And the people, when I come to London or any other country, they look at me like if we were under a uh, colonial era in France. They say, well, when I come to London, they would say, make the for the brother, they are suffering so much in Paris. So we have the status of being a victim in one of the hot spots of Islamophobia. But let's face it, it has nothing to compare with hardcore violence in Eastern Europe or what the people are going through in Gaza, for example. Still, we are a country of freedom and of rights. But this freedom and rights, they only get used, they only get damaged when we don't use them. I have a question for you. Why are we here today? Is there any one of us here who thinks seriously that Islamophobia is not a critical issue? If there is, please raise your hand. And the others, please don't get on him. <laughs> so there's no one. So the job today is not to say whether there is a problem or not. There is a problem. The question is how do we tackle it? How do we move forward to change the situation? And I don't know for you, but I've always dreamed of being part of a fight for justice. Ever since I was a kid, I used to dream that, please God, take me back in time so I can be fighting injustice next to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Or please take me back in time just 50 years ago so that I can fight with Gandhi or Malcolm X or whoever. And I want to be just there, I want to be one of the guys saying, fight the power in the community. <laughs> well, here is our fight. And it's not less important. It's just another fight for justice. So we need to, we need to be up to the challenge. So we need to be realistic and we need to move from consciousness to action. Islamophobia nowadays is just another weapon of mass distraction. It's a distraction from the real problem we are facing as a society. Why would we explain ourselves on our nuclear choices and the suffering that people go through every day? Why we, just, we can just shift attention by saying, look at this Muslim there, they are not part of the society. So we need to stand firm on this and say, don't want to talk about this. This Muslim guy or this Muslim uh, sister, I grew up with her. I know what she's, uh, what she's like. I'm, I've studied with her. I've been here for her wedding. I've been here when her son is born. So now you're not going to come at me and tell me that just because she wears a niqab, she's, she's completely different than anyone. She's like Batman. When she wears it, she's completely different. So we, we, we need to shift attention back to the real, uh, the real matter. And so, in this, type of, in this type of situation, what I see is that people suffer, and the people who are activists and who are supposed to take action, they are in a state some kind of despair. They say, oh, what can we do facing this media machine and this political machine and this economic machine? And we are just small organizations, small NGOs, and we are... <coughs> well, actually, 
change doesn't come in the mailbox. Excuse me. All the time through history, the victim, the people suffering this injustice, uh, it's not Hosni Mubarak who came to us in Egypt and said, look guys, I've been tough on you for all these years. Here is, the, here is your freedom. I'm just going to get back to show the shit and enjoy the It doesn't happen like that. We need to bring a change. We need to create the conditions for change to happen. Injustice is there, that's for sure. But let's face it. The stronger the injustice, the stronger the incentive to change things. So usually when, when it becomes like the, the unbearable situation, that's exactly the moment where change happens. The condition prior revolution in the, in the, in the, in the Middle, Middle East of the world, they were extremely bad just before the revolution. And then change came upon just because a group of people took upon themselves, themselves to make change happen. So let's think uh, about this in a positive manner. The first thing that we need to do, because I know that people like when we tell them what to do, right? and that's a condition that we have since, since childhood, is that we expect someone to just come on this stage and say, guys, let's do this. And we are going to follow this charismatic leader wherever he leads us, and that we are, we are going to just say no as he says. So my point is that the first thing is we need to stand up and be proud about what we are. We need to stand up and be proud. Are you proud of what you are? Whoever you are, whatever you are, you are a Muslim, a non-Muslim, you are a part of a movement, you are a part of something, and you stand up for justice, be proud about that. It's worth being proud of that. The second thing is to realize that every one of us is an agent of change. When we discuss with colleagues, when we discuss in the street, when we vote against or for a political figure, we change something. And if there is one thing that is for sure, is that people respond to incentives. That's the, the, the main, that's the basis of, of, uh, of uh, behavioral uh, <coughs> sciences, is that people respond to incentives. And today's incentive is that Muslim bashing is a national sport in France. And so it's cool to be an Islamophobe. And it uh, allows you to write books, to be invited to TV shows, and to become a political uh, figure just because you say that Muslims are not part of the country. So we need to change this incentive. Things are going to change when the perpetrator, when they act on Islamophobia, they are going to be sure that they are going to be punished for that, and they are going to be sent to jail for, for that. Politicians and economists, they are going to change their behavior regarding minorities when they are sure that we represent uh, a, a, an electoral, a political force, and that we are going to make them pay the policy that they put in place today against minorities. Usually, this type of uh, setup of uh, speakers, panel speaker, panel of speakers, and, uh, and and the audience is like we share our experience, and you listen to it to the experience, and just go away with it. And I end up with telling you that the important thing is not what we do for change; the important thing is what you are going to make of it. Thank you.